Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Heights, and I'm also the founder of Prep Athletics. And on today's episode, we are happy to have Adam Finkelstein. Adam is a scout and recruiting analyst, an ESPN host, founder of the New England Recruiting Report, and host of the Upside Podcast. Prior to all this, Adam was an assistant at the D3 program, Western Connecticut State, before then going to the D1 program, the University of Hartford. He's worked for the NBA's director of scouting, Marty Blake, and is the former head prep basketball coach at Choate Rosemary Hall. Adam, thanks so much for joining today. Thanks for having me. You know, I went back to our emails and it was December, 2012. I asked you the most common question I get every day. And I said, hey, someone told me to ask you about prep schools and I'm trying to place a kid that has no money. Who do I talk to? <laughs> and that seems like my number one question. And you were kind enough back then to like give me the rundown on things uh, coming from a nobody email. And now Prep Athletics has kind of taken off nine years later. So I kind of want to thank you for uh, taking the time to. Uh, oh, I had nothing to do with that. That's uh, yeah, nothing at all. That's I, I hope you I'm sure you did get that kid placed. Probably had better luck than I, I could have helped you with. Yeah, it did work. You gave me some good suggestions and they actually ended up where you suggested. So thank oh, you good. for that. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of fun stuff today. But first, I want to talk about you being a college coach, both at the D3 level and at the D1 level. And you coached for Larry Harrison. Larry's a good friend of ours because we're associated with WVU basketball since my dad played there. Um, so cool. I know he was a great influence. But give me the main takeaway you took away from being at Western Connecticut State and then from Hartford. Uh, you know, I think the main takeaway for me is just it, it was my dream to be a college basketball coach. And I was exceptionally fortunate to get there and get there as quickly as I, I did. I mean, I was 24 when Larry hired me on the road uh, at Hartford. And, um, it was, uh, you know, it was an, a tremendous opportunity, but it wasn't all that, you know, it wasn't necessarily the lifestyle that I thought it would be. And, um, and so it allowed me to kind of the fact that I got there as quickly as I did and got to experience it. I, I don't want to say I was able to like check it off the bucket list, but I was able to say like, okay, maybe this isn't all that I you know, wanted it to be. And, and, um, and maybe I want to go explore some other kind of tangential areas of the business. And it, had it taken me 10 years to get there or whatever, and, and, or had I never gotten there, got there at all, I never would have known what it was. And I always kind of would have had this like, you know, glorified um, impression of what life as a college coach would like. And I probably would have always been chasing it. So the biggest takeaway for me was that I was able to experience it and was able to realize that like, hey, this is great, but it's, it's not necessarily the specific niche in the business that I necessarily want. And, and because of it, I was able to pursue other things. And all those, those things you, you listed off before, none of those would have been possible if I didn't have that, that Division I coaching uh, experience on, on my resume, I don't think. Yeah, and now you can actually tell people uh, what a D1 player or program's looking for right? You know what the other side of, you know, the conversations is now, and that's only going to help you as a scout and as eventually becoming a prep school coach, right? Yeah, yeah, it certainly did. I mean, uh, as a scout, I, I tried to tailor everything I did to what I would have wanted when I was uh, an assistant coach at the division one level. And as a prep school coach, it was a lot of fun because, um, you know, to be honest, I, prep, coaching in prep school was kind of the inversion of coaching in college and that I wasn't as enthusiastic going in and when it was all said and done, it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. And it was everything, you know, if, if someone, it would have been a great life to live if it would have been a full-time livelihood to just be a prep school basketball coach. Unfortunately, that's not really how it works, but um, that's, but that was fun because it was like, I, first of all, I was working with great kids in an amazing place. And it was, it was kind of like my own lab. That's really where I learned how to coach. And I know that sounds um, counterintuitive because I had been a division one coach, but it's not until you're a head coach and I don't care what level it is that you're fully accountable. I mean, listen, at Hartford, we got fired and I lost way more sleep as the head coach at show and no one was going to fire me. I mean, we were, we were five and 15 our first year and 
uh, and then gradually built that program up and won the first uh, New England championship in school history. But, but that's where I learned how to coach because it's like a lab where you get to try new things every year, sometimes even every day, figure out what works, what works for the group of kids you have. And without the, the pressure of knowing your jobs on the line each and every, every year. Right now, obviously I'm the big bullhorn for prep schools and you are too, cause you've been in that world, but you also do other scouting as well. Now that you've been out in the world and been a D one coach, been a D three coach, been at a prep school, have a scouting report. Why don't you give folks out there that are listening, like what's the biggest difference between a prep school player versus like a normal high school player? Stereotypically. Well, yeah, I, I think so. My take on prep schools is, is a little it, maybe a little different because I, I think there's a lot of room for nuance. Um, you know, there's there's nuance in where you go to prep school. Uh, you know, the experience. Let's just take where I was. There was a vast difference in the kids who played for me year one at Choate when I had one division three player versus um, at year eight when, when I was done, um, you know, my last four years there everybody who got on, you couldn't get on the court if you weren't a college player. And you probably weren't in the starting lineup unless you were a scholarship caliber player. And, and that was in the third best league in the NEPSAC. So um, I, I think the, and, and, you know, quite frankly, there's other prep schools. I mean, there's six divisions in the NEPSAC. The new NEPSAC is the New England uh, athletic prep, uh, get all the letters mixed up, but it's basically the New England prep league. And, you know, if you're in class D, most kids aren't college players. So I think that, that uh, but if you're in AAA and you're at a Brewster Northfield Mount Hermon game, then everybody's a division one player. So I, I think there's a lot of room for nuance. Um, but if you're talking about the high, high end levels of prep school basketball, which I think most people are, um, I, I think the biggest difference is just the level of competition. Uh, one of the things I get quite a lot is, um, you know, people say, oh, you're biased towards the prep schools. And I said, I'm biased to where the players are. And the players are, are statistically uh, in the prep schools, at least in the area of the country I'm from. Obviously, there's a big geographic component to that. But in New England, that's just been the that's that's been the way the landscape has evolved over the years. Um, and but I'm not just to clarify, I'm not a believer that prep school is right for absolutely everyone. I'm not a believer that every prep school is, you know, if if you can go, not everyone who, who can uh, go to any school should automatic. not everyone can play at Brewster Academy, quite frankly. Um, you know, Jason himself would, would tell you, he, I think he coined the phrase, there's a thin line between expo exposure and exposed. And, and right. there, you know, so y you have to find the right fit for you. I think fortunately, um, prep schools have grown and are growing geographically into different parts of the country where there is a fit for everyone. So you can figure out athletically what you want and what you need, because they aren't necessarily the same thing. Uh, academically, what you're, what you're uh, looking for, geographically, what you're looking for, um, put all those things together. And there is a, you know, there's probably a school for you. I mean, I, I think that's probably the biggest thing for me is when someone calls and says, um, you know, I'm looking for a prep school, what do you recommend? my, I usually respond with the question of, well, what are you looking for? What, what's the academic criteria? What's the athletic criteria? Do you want to play with the best players or do you want to go to the place where you're going to be at the most, uh, get the most playing time? So there's a lot of nuance to it, I think. And, and so I, I don't think it's, it's necessarily the one size fits all, but at the, at the high levels, um, there, there's just, there's no denying that it is a, at least where I'm from, a, a higher level of competition than you see in the, in the state associations on average. Yeah, absolutely. Now you mentioned prep schools starting to get out of new England and go more West. Yeah. I call those pop-up academies, right? Okay. Now there, there are some that have schools and dorms and stuff, but you and I could start a prep school tomorrow and, and, you know, with your house, with a van, with a gym and everything. So with this new proliferation of the pop-up academies, which some are good, some are nightmares, what are your thoughts on that as a scout? Like if a place is a little bit sketchy and you know, they've got players, do you visit there to legitimize it or, or just give me your basic thoughts on this new thing. That's, that seems to be just new and starting every day out there. Well, so again, I, I think the same, my opinion is the same is that I, I don't want to paint with a, a broad strokes. You know, I, I want to see what's legitimate and what's not. And, and so that's why, 
Um, you know, for years, I, I've kind of coordinated the National Prep School Championship, and we've always had pretty stringent academic uh, policies because the legitimate prep schools, uh, to your point, don't want to legitimize places that, that aren't doing it the right way, not just in terms of meeting all the NCA's, uh, you know, regulations and requirements, but also just doing it in an ethical way. You know, you, you could have everybody taking schools from the same online academy, and that doesn't mean they've all got a bed and, and, and the right type of nutrition every day. So what I've tried to do over the years, more so in my capacity as, as kind of coordinating these, these national championships for prep schools and anything having to do with scouting or ESPN, is, vid is visit as many of these places as I can. I haven't been to all of them, um, but I'd say I've been to about 90% of them. And certainly now I've been to uh, what I consider to be all the legitimate ones on the East Coast. So I've traveled South and, and gone to, cause I'm based in Connecticut. So, you know, gone into New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania years ago, uh, then down into Maryland and, and started to visit Florida annually a couple of years ago, at least before the pandemic didn't get there this past, uh, past fall. But um, and then the stuff out West, I, I have not yet been to uh, quite as frequently, but I, I think with anything else, it's, it's, um, you know, in these polarizing times we live in, I think there's this, there's this uh, kind of urge to, to just say like, oh, all pop-up prep schools are bad. Well, that's not necessarily the case, but you have to do your research and, and do your due diligence. And um, I think so to your question from a scouting standpoint, um, the scouting aspect of it, which is strictly basketball related requires you to go, as I said before, to where the players are. Mm -hmm. So there may be some places that, that are not very legitimate academically. Um, but if college coaches are recruiting those kids and they're deemed eligible by the NCA and the eligibility center, then as a scout, you, you're kind of, um, you're kind of required to go see where those, those players may be. Now I, I will tell you that over the years I've been to places, um, and seen places, as I said, I've tried to lay eyes on as much as I could myself. Um, that you know are not legitimate, you know, and for whatever the case may be, it becomes pretty clear. Um, sometimes that's, uh, there's malicious motivations. It's just a cash grab and, and you, you, uh, you know, you, you feel bad for the kids who are kind of getting um, misled in that. Um, and other times it's, it's not so malicious It's people who are, have good intentions, who are trying to help kids, but don't know all the intricacies of the NCA rules. That's something I've been able to help people with over the years, especially as it relates to the scholastic versus non-scholastic definition. I remember, I remember visiting Spire a couple of years ago, they brought me out and, and sitting down with their academic people and, uh, you know, just helping to educate them on the difference between the rules NCA enforcement has and the NCA eligibility center has because it's, you know, it, it does, you know, there is a lot there. Um, and so I think that, that, you know, scouting, you got to go where the players are. Um, but from a kind of someone who takes a, a lot of pride in his prep school relationships and is, it believes that, that those legitimate prep schools serve a very important value and, and wants to help schools that, that strive to, kind of follow that example. Um, that, that's been fun for me to visit different places and help them try to try to follow that model and, and do it the right way if that's what they strive to do. Yeah, a couple of notes on that. Mike Hart always says he's only gonna play programs that have a principal and a prom. That's his favorite <laughs> quote right there. And then secondly, you know, I will say like, look, there are some great places out there uh, that offer this non-traditional prep school uh, option for postgrads. In fact, next week, I'm going to have one of those coaches on so he can, we can delve into this world. We have it on. Uh, to be, to be continued. I was, that, okay. Okay. Don't want to no keep spoilers. that. Yeah. No spoilers, <laughs> no spoilers right. yet, but you'll like it. You know him. Okay. And uh, he's former D one coach, high major, former prep school coach who now started his own thing. So that's a guy there. I got you. Knows, I know who it is. You know who it yeah. is. Okay. Um, yeah. And the next thing is do your due diligence. So I'm working on, yep. you know, 30 questions that a family should take to any of these places mm -hmm. and ask them and see how you feel. Then go visit and use your gut too. you know, your gut can really help you on some of these situations. But, you know, for for kids, it's a chance and sometimes their last chance and it's worth an opportunity. Yeah. You just have to know going in like, hey, this might we might be eating the same meals over and over again. There might be 50 guys in the program. There might be six roommates with me. You have to know that. And right. people come out of that all the time. They get seen by guys like you and it can help them reach their dream. But there's also a lot of salesmanship out there too. And a lot of stuff being spouted that 
is not oh true. it's a hustle i mean there's there's a hustle and it's as i said there's a lot of money making for profit initiatives that are it's why we've been so careful with like our fields at our events because i do i do not want to legitimize these places that are not doing it the right way i mean there have been some player uh, places that have had some players that we have turned down and just said you know and, it, and it's really because you know, I've got to give credit to like some of the godfathers here of prep school basketball, you know, the, the Jerry Quinns and Whit Lejeurs and, and those guys who just said like, we're not, you know, we're not going to legitimize. We don't want it. Kevin Keats was huge on this when he was at, at Hargrave, obviously now he's the head coach at NC State. But, you know, when, when you coach at a legitimate place, you don't want to, um, you don't want to legitimize places that aren't and aren't even really attempting to be in the parts of the experience that most people don't see the educational the the housing part i mean those things are, are huge yeah and full disclosure you know six years ago i was helping kids that did not have much money and i would place them in some of these pitch situations and these coaches made a great pitch they're great salesmen yeah. and i had to i had to pull them out of there and find them other places one place i had to rescue a kid at midnight because it was so yeah. treacherous so it was I've had those experiences, right? I've, I've yeah. heard the conversations, what the coaches tell you. I've heard what the parents and kids say after being there. And so I've, I've got experience and just, that's why I'm on my bullhorn here. Just saying, you can go to those, just make sure you ask these tough questions. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then go from there. But I was always curious about how the scouts like yourself kind of. Viewed if there's, it. if there's players, you gotta, you gotta see them, you know, especially cause I view it as this, like just as a scout, it, it's not for me to decide if the NCAA yeah. says it's okay. And, and now, nowadays, if the NBA says it's okay, then, then I've got to see those kids, you know, the people, the, the clientele that we service college coaches, NBA executives, like they need those people seen. And, and as I said, I've been in some places where I just, I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, like, yeah. oh, they got to leave practice. Cause they got to go, you know, work at the bakery. Like, are you serious? You know, like, um, so that's, you know, I've been to those places and it's, it's, um, it's disheartening when you see it. Yeah. Talk to me about your New England recruiting reports. I mean, this is kind of the Bible for uh, the New England scene and for coaches to look at that and then plan their trips. And um, I, I think it's a fantastic product you offer there. And, and that's actually been something too, Adam, that I've told kids like, hey, if you go to one of these prep schools, you're going to be in this report, which means, you know, you've been scouted, coaches are going to look at. I think it's a big advantage uh, to going to a prep school. Tell me how it started and what your thoughts are on how it benefits players. So it started in, um, let me get the year right here. Um, it started in 2006 and a, I was at the university of Hartford on the road and, uh, we weren't, we weren't winning and it was someone actually, someone else approached me with the idea, J.R. Hargraves, who at the time was running the Connecticut basketball club is pretty prominent AAU organization, uh, had Andre Drummond and Chris Dunn and, and uh, a variety of other guys. Uh, it was actually his idea and he came to me with it. And um, I remember at the time he pitched it as the NJ Hoops of New England. Um, NJ Hoops kind of had this website and, and it was a, a big popular resource for kids. And, and so, uh, you know, and I remember he said, uh, he said to me, he said, you know, if this doesn't work out, you know, cause the, the rumor mill kind of, you know, if you're in trouble, people are whispering about it early. So, um, and we did, in fact, get fired that year. I mean, uh, ironically, we, we rebounded and uh, Larry won coach of the year in the conference. We finished third, uh, but we, we still got fired. So it was kind of a, a brutal introduction to Division One college coaching. And, um, and then I took him up on it, quite frankly. Uh, you know, I remember he, he and I sat down, we started, to, started it together. We kind of co-founded it. Uh, a few years later, he ended up getting out of it. So he just was doing the AU side and I was doing the um, just the New England recruiting report side. And it's been over 15 years now. So I think it'll be 16 years, um, if my math's not mistaken, uh, coming up this this um, this summer. So it'll be um, it'll be so it, it started as a website that was we initially designed it to be a uh, as we said, kind of an NJ hoops, which was part of the rivals network, you know, or some the password protected site. And then what we found out is it, it, it ended up just being a good way to market, whether it was events or my scouting service or whatever. And the scouting service was initially called new England recruiting report as well. I had to differentiate that a few years, uh, maybe five years or so, because the, the NCA wanted 
um, didn't want you to have the same name basically as something that was free online. So now my scouting service is called the Northeast Recruiting Report and it includes all the Northeast region, which is New England, uh, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, Delaware, and, and DC, that DMV area with Maryland and Northern Virginia as well. <clears throat> so we call that the Northeast Recruiting Report now. And New England Recruiting Report is uh, still a website. It's, it's, we've got all that information up there. It's still totally free of charge. There's no password protected stuff, but daily content. And that's expanded to include Obviously, social media has grown over the years, uh, various platforms now from from Twitter to Instagram to YouTube to the, uh, the podcast you mentioned. I'm, I'm really hoping we don't have to be on TikTok one day, but I'm sure something new will come along sooner rather than later. So, um, yeah, and, and what we try and do is, is just cover cover the region as, as well as we can. But we try and do it ethically. Uh, you know, when I started this, as I said, I was so I was at. Um, 24 when I got hired at Hartford, got fired eight months later. So I was 25 starting this. And what I've really gotten an appreciation for over the years is, is the way to promote kids, but do it in a way which, which doesn't create a, a burden for them um, psychologically and, and create these lofty expectations. It's sometimes a 15 year old who's dominating an AAU game may just be doing it because he's an early bloomer. He's bigger and stronger at an early age and not necessarily because he's bound to be a high major recruit because uh, maybe he's done growing. And so try and promote it in ways that, that, um, that, you know, encourages kids to, to play the game, highlights them when they do well, highlights them for, for their future potential, but at the same time, doesn't, doesn't burden them with, with what can sometimes be these unfair labels and early expectations. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're going to a lot of open gyms, you're doing the B scene tour. Um, but then during the summer and spring, you've got to pick AU events to attend. Mm -hmm. So with all of them out there, how do you decipher which ones you want to want to go to? So New England recruiting report started 15 years ago, uh, I caught on with ESPN 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago now. Um, and so, you know, ESPN is has to be my first uh, obligation. And so, um, you know, if it's especially in the live period, but I've got to do the sneaker circuits and I've got to do USA basketball and I've got to do the big national events every year. Um, so what I try and do then is see the local teams in the other weekends, quite frankly. So, uh, you know, in a normal year when we have a live period in April, I, that's why I go around to all the practices and all the open gyms and, and the, the local tournaments, because I want to make sure that I don't, um, don't, you know, it's a cliche, but don't, don't forget where you came from. But more importantly, I just, I just want to make sure I've got my backyard that I know what's going on in my backyard, take a lot of pride in that. But when, you know, those big events come up, I've, I've got to fulfill my responsibilities for ESPN. And I can't just be at those events, just watching the, the teams from the Northeast. I've got to be, be seeing everybody and, and doing those kids, doing right by those kids who are all fighting for, you know, national recognition uh, that a brand like ESPN uh, has to offer. So um, that's basically how I do it. Um, you know, in, in a, if there's a big national event, that's where I've got to be. And I try and check the local stuff off uh, in between. But um, I, I'd say the biggest philosophy within that is uh, bang for your buck. You know, if I've mm -hmm. got to choose between three tournaments on a weekend, I'm going to the place that has, that I can see the most uh, players possible. Now, as we get later into the year, if there's a couple guys uh, that, that I haven't seen yet that I need to, then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll chase a few kids here and there and, and go to an event that I might not otherwise go to because I, there's a couple kids there that I need to see. We, we track, I've got guys on my team like, like Zach Sandberg and they help me track um, kids throughout the Northeast region. Anybody, you know, we're on Twitter, monitoring Twitter and, and Instagram every day. So if a kid gets an offer or he gets a call or something, we monitor that. And then I add that those to the list of kids I want to see and get eyes on myself. And so, um, and so that's how that would evolve. If there was a kid I haven't seen yet who has a little bit of a reputation, uh, then maybe late in the summer, I might, I might chase them or find a way to see them. But typically it's about, as I said, where can I get the biggest bang for my buck in terms of seeing the greatest amount of talent uh, on, on one day or one weekend and, and being as efficient as possible. Right. That's good. You got to do that, especially working for ESPN. You got to get the most bang for your buck. Um, 
Tell me an instance from your scouting days where you might have seen a kid walking by a court uh, or, you know, on court 23 out of 24 and someone told you about them. No one knew about them, but you saw something special there and your write up helped propel him to a level that he would have normally not had. Um, you know, uh, so I'm going to go with a recency bias here because uh, I, I tweet. <laughs> I tweeted yesterday, there was a, a kid from, the, and he, this kid hasn't, hasn't um, really quote unquote blown up yet, but yesterday I was scrolling through Twitter and the New Jersey Panthers tweeted about a, a kid and I'd just seen them in a workout setting. And this is a kid who doesn't have any division one recruitment, but he really shoots it. He knows how to play. He's got a D one frame. He's still growing into his body. So I just responded to the tweet and said something like sleeper, which is very rarely, I, something I would do. Um, you know, normally kind of, uh, you know, insight like that, I usually save for my scouting service. It goes directly out to college coaches. Um, but there is, uh, you know, I, I think that, that cases like that happen pretty frequently. I mean, I really view that as that's my job. I mean, I could tell you about the time when I saw Mo Bamba when he was 14 years old and I knew right, right away. And that's true. Um, but like the reality is, is that there's, there's, um, there's guys like that who don't have a reputation who maybe you see and, and you see something because, uh, they haven't, they haven't had the platform yet, or maybe their game fits the college game better than it does the high school game, or they haven't. So, um, so this, this most recent one, as I said, is, is certainly an example of recency bias, but it's a, it's a good kind of example of stuff that, that if I'm doing my job well happens happens at least annually where I can find some guys that, that don't really have a big reputation yet. When you said sleeper, what happened after that tweet? I don't know. It was about, it was about 18 hours ago. I know they, they screenshotted it and put it on Instagram, but we'll have to, we'll have to circle back in a month or two and see if, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe I saw him on a great day that that's certainly possible. And he's not quite as good as I thought he was, but maybe, um, it was a sign of things to come. And he, he, you know, is a guy who should be recruited by scholarship level schools and just hasn't been yet. And, and uh, that'll play itself out in the next couple of months here. We'll have yeah. to, we'll have to see. Okay. Um, ESPN, tell me what your role is there specifically. Mm -hmm. And what are the perks of working at a place like that? Uh, so that's changed over the years. When I got there, as I said, 10 plus years ago, there were about six of us there. I mean, it was, it was myself, it was uh, Paul Biancardi, it was Reggie Rankin, it was John Stovall, it was Mike LaPlante, it was Joel Francesco, then it was Dave Tellup. So, uh, you know, we had we had seven of us and um, we were all in different parts of the country. So initially it came in and I was in charge of the Northeast region, which is why kind of my scouting service expanded from New England uh, into the entire Northeast region, because it was just, it mirrored what I was doing for, for ESPN. And, and what I was charged with then was knowing all was knowing all of the division one prospects in the area at the time we had to write evaluations on the site of everybody uh, that wanted to do a big database with scouting reports of every division one prospect in the country and so it was very much a, a geographic type of of model uh where i was in the northeast and and uh you know reggie was in Reggie was in Ohio and then in Florida and John was in Ohio and Paul was in North Carolina and Joel was in the West coast. And, um, so it just, or, you know, Michael plant was, was, uh, was he in Arkansas? Maybe I can't remember exactly, but just different guys who were in different parts of the country. And we all had, as I said, kind of took ownership of our, our backyard. Now over the years, that team has, has gotten smaller. And so now Paul and I are, are kind of the two, uh, Paul certainly being the, the, the pre, uh, director of national recruiting and, and me being, I joke that he's, he's the head coach and I'm the assistant coach, but you know, we're the two visible faces of it now. So we've got to go out and see as much as we can and, and, and uh, to get our, our rankings as, as accurate as they, they possibly can be. Are those rankings just you two guys figuring all that out? There's a smaller team uh, on it that, that, you know, I mean, two guys can't do it. Uh, themselves accurately so we have to to lean on a variety of you know we do our due diligence and, and talk to people we trust in different places but he and i are the the public faces of it right now yeah gotcha what about the perks of espn any do you get a t-shirt or free parking i space do have some gear time? yeah i do i do have some gear um the uh so that's that's been fun um that's been fun and, and listen when you 
when you are associated with a brand like like ESPN, um, I mean, it, it's it's uh, it's pretty cool, you know, to be able to. I, I know uh, I got quoted in the local paper the other day and had no idea. Uh, I think they just they just kind of like ripped off something I said on Instagram or something, and and um, my parents were 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 pretty happy because it's you know the front you know it said something like ESPN's Adam Finkelstein or something. So um, that part's been a lot of fun being able to. Uh, being able to learn how to work on TV um, has been a tremendous uh, learning and growth experience for me because I didn't I didn't have any you know when I started this I I I, I didn't have media training I wasn't a, I was I majored in business and minored in poli sci I didn't take one journalism class didn't take one communications class uh, might have taken communications 101 but that's just because it was a, an easy A back in the day at UConn. Um, but didn't have any formal training. So being able to learn how to do TV and, and how to do, I would, so to answer your question, I, I'd say that the, the coolest thing has been the opportunity to learn so many different parts of the business, not just the scouting side, which is what I was initially hired for, but being able to write uh, for .com, being able to, to call games, being able to be in, um, in studio to do sideline, uh, to, to be able to do a variety of different things and to do it at, at, at ESPN, you know, the worldwide leader. That's great. I mean, that the skill set you've got doing that, that you, you didn't even expect, no. uh, has just really added. And you can tell through your podcast and just, just now you're just so comfortable with, with doing this kind of thing. And that came from well, it's, your experience. It's reps, you yeah. know, I mean, and, and I don't know that I'm, I, I don't know that I'm any good at it, but I know that I, I know that I'm better than I was 10 years ago. Um, that's for sure. And just, and you can just feel it too. You know, I mean, I, I remember the first time they put me on, on TV at the peach jam, and like I was wearing these baggy cargo pants. It was, it was awful. Um, and then I, you know, and, and I remember my heart pounding and I was like, Oh my God, I'm on national TV. I'm going to look stupid. I'm going to say something stupid. And, and, uh, you know, that kind of goes away. You still get the rush, which is, which is, uh, I think what, you know, everybody should kind of look for in their, their, you know, professional lives is that excitement, but there's not the, there's not the same level of like anxiety, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. Uh, and, and fortunately, um, you know, I have better pants now too. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Cargo pants have kind of died. So that's good. You yeah, come with the yeah, times. Exactly. Exactly. Let's dreamscape in 10 years. If you can, if you can pick how your life ends up, uh, professionally, what does that look like? I don't know. Um, when I was 25, I would have, I had a plan when I was 30, I had a plan and, um, I would say, so I don't have a, a predetermined destination in mind The the, the most ironic thing that ever happened to me was I got offered my dream job, uh, and I turned it down. And that was, uh, that was, was, I was offered director of scouting for the Boston Celtics who I grew up idolizing and my wife was six months pregnant with our first child I would have had to move to Boston which is only two hours but not still a big deal and been on the road 200 days a year and um and I said no and if you had told me I would have done that growing up or five years earlier I would have said there's no way possible so um, you know, what will it look, look like 15 years from now I don't know I, I know that um, I know that my priorities will be um, you know, I don't uh, say this to be holier than thou or anything, but my family is always going to be my top priority. I've got two young kids. They're most important in, in terms of um, me. And I, I just want to be excited. You know, that same, like I said, that same uh, kind of feeling when you're getting ready to go on TV. So I think doing new things and evolving is a big part of that. And exactly what that may look like in 15 years i don't know because i do think the the opportunity to kind of challenge yourself and do different things and explore different avenues and is something that i've been very lucky to do when you think about the the yukon ma manager to the d3 assistant to to the path that i've been fortunate enough to go on so uh so i don't know where it'll be but i just i just don't want it to be stagnant i want it to keep evolving keep motivating me and to kind of have that that rush of excitement uh when you get up and get ready to go do your quote unquote job because that's that's the thing i haven't had i've never i haven't had a sunday night in 15 years you know where you're dreading going to work mm -hmm. on monday morning every every day's i, I haven't had a day off I, I mean i'm sure i've had a couple but for the most part you know you don't take days off either 
Um, but uh, so I, I would just say I never want a Sunday night or, or a Friday afternoon. Thank God it's the weekend. And, and as long as I as long as we stay on that path and then uh, then I can't complain. Perfect. Perfect. Well, we're going to finish up here with a lightning round, uh, some quick hitters. And uh, I'm curious to hear some of your answers to this. What is the best? Who's the best player you coached against while at Hartford? The be- at Hartford. I know it's only one season, but was there one? Yeah, that's, um, can I pick a coach? Can I, can I, can I do an audible here? Absolutely. So we had my first scouting report at Hartford and I texted him this, uh, about six months ago was against Steve Donahue at Penn. I mean, here I am 24 years old, Steve Donahue. I'm sorry, not at Penn. He was at, at Cornell at the time. Um, and they were just, they were starting to ascend into that team that would go to the sweet 16 running two guard. And, and I had no idea what I was doing. And that was such a crash course in, in the first, uh, in terms of your first division one scouting report, it was kind of like, okay, you're not a D three anymore. Here's a, and so I look back at that, you know, I texted him a picture of that. I still have the VHS tape and the written scouting report. And I texted him like six months ago, just to say like, God, I had no idea what you were doing back then. Um, but uh, so that was, that's really the one that, that, that sticks out. I mean, uh, you know, in the America East at that time, I think it was Jameer Wilson, I think was his name at, at Albany. Um, he played for Will Brown and, and they were, uh, he was, he was as good as, he was as good as the league had. I mean, we had the best player in the league. His name was Kenny Adelike from New York, but um, Jameer was certainly the best kind of playmaking guard in the league at that time. How about it choked? Uh, who was the best player in those eight years that you coached against? Uh, Chris McCullough, who played mm. at, uh, you know, he, he went on to the NBA. He was at Salisbury. Um, and so he was, he was, he was the most talented guy we, we went up against, but they're, you know, some of those Hotchkiss teams were really good. They had like Jason Morris and Derek Wilson and guys like that. Um, so we were, uh, but, but I, I would, uh, those would be the first Chris McCullough. I think, you know, he played in the NBA, so he's pretty darn good. Yeah. This is going to be a tough one to narrow down, but as a scout, what's like the one performance you witnessed that just stands above all the rest. Oh, in terms of like, who had like one game where you were like, holy mo- yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I remember, um, around the time when I said I was transitioning from being a regional guy to more of a national guy, uh, when elite 24 was in New York city and I had, I was only doing Northeast stuff. And then I went to go see, see them work out cause it was in New York. And I, I remember, um, just getting eyes on Brandon Ingram. So this is like the summer before his senior year. And I, it was just so obvious. I thought it was like, good, like his talent, he was just oozing that kind of talent. So there, there's been, some of those moments over the years, quite a few of them, honestly. Um, but in terms of like, because I, I was seeing him later in the process, I, that, that one really resonated to me as like, you know, holy cow, this kid's just, I mean, his talent is, doesn't take a scout to see it. Anybody in the building could just say like, who's that guy? Mm-hmm. Favorite movie of all time? Uh, forcing Star Wars on my kids now. Um, looking forward to doing that with, with Godfather as they get earlier. So as they get, get, uh, get older. So I would say one of those two, one of those two genres. Okay. And then lastly, when you're not doing scouting, um, or basketball business, what are your hobbies? Uh, very different now. I posted a picture on Instagram of, um, me doing Pilates like a couple of weeks ago and the, the, uh, the feedback from the basketball community was, was hysterical. You know, it was like basically doing a handstand and um, there was, I got some saying like, what the, are you doing? I got others saying that's awesome. But um, you know, that's, that's been cool. Um, You know, learning Pilates last couple of years has been fun. Um, I actually like to play tennis. I grew up playing tennis. I stopped uh, for 15 years. And then when the pandemic started, got into it again, Uh, like to read, um, but that is, and I, I'm, I'm big because I'm in the car so much. I'm a pretty avid podcast listener as well. What's one you'd recommend? Uh, aside from present company, not included, I tend to do a lot of, uh, a lot of Tim Ferriss podcasts. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That I tell you what, I, I listen to less music now because of podcasts. I yeah. I don't be, listen to Yeah. Yeah. It's and that, as you can see behind me, all the concert posters, that used to be my life. And uh, 
now it's podcast because it's just it's so interesting and any topic just bouncing around subject to subject i think is just fascinating so this is i'll leave you with this my college job um or a little little like side hustle was we used to do security uh you know when you go to those concerts they'd sell like the bootleg t-shirts outside yes so i was uh me and a buddy of mine got hired to be bootleg t-shirt security so our job was to walk around mostly the meadows in hartford but and take away the guys who were selling uh take away the t-shirts from guys who were selling unlicensed products on the grounds and that was only before and after the show so during the show we got to go in awesome. and i'm not a huge like music fan but i like i remember i remember uh i mean some of the ones i didn't go into were crazy but i remember like i was probably six feet away from from steven tyler when aerosmith was going on mm. and so some going into some of that stuff was was pretty cool but um, yeah I, yeah when i took the job at hartford that was the end of my security days and the last thing i'll end on is i did that too at, at red rocks to where they had the basketball oh, cool. team come up for santana yeah and since i was six seven they put me on the side of the stage with the, my other six eight teammates and i had a six four buddy that was out in the parking lot doing the whole bootleg uh, t-shirt so yeah 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 always, fake tie-dyed santana shirts right like, yeah we, exactly yep. we all had yep. one yep. so well adam hey thanks so much for coming on today it's it's been a pure joy talking to you and learn some more about your process and uh i'm, I'm going to promote your podcast the upside it's got a lot of good basketball intel on there and why don't you tell the listeners um how they can find you on social so i'm just adam finkelstein uh twitter and instagram shout out to adam finkelstein the the princeton professor who just allowed me to have the handle um greatly appreciate it so that was uh yeah that's it adam finkelstein f-i-n-k-e-l-s-t-e-i-n -E -E and uh thanks very much for having me on it's been a lot of fun all right thanks for joining us today on the prep athletics podcast if you like what you're hearing go ahead and subscribe on all the podcast platforms subscribe on youtube and uh, sign up for the newsletter at prepathletics.com we'll see y'all next week